my five greatest stories. Number one. How was it feeling when you won the first Grand Slam? How, what, what are you feeling inside of so many years of hard work? You know, how yeah. was that feeling? Uh, I won the, the first Grand Slam was in Australia, 1981, I think. Yes. It's amazing. I mean, you know, I was, I think I was 18 or 19 and 18 and um, it was an amazing feeling. Um, you know, I was playing Wendy Turnbull, my uh, doubles partner in the future. And I won the first, first set six laps and five. And I just, you know, I played really good tennis and um, it was amazing. You know, the first, first time, finally, you, you know, you feel like you, all the hard work paid off and, 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 you know, you're extremely happy. You know, these memories, it's, it's weird because you, I, I mean, especially me, I remember all the, all the finals of the Grand Slams and the feeling I got, you know, it was always dif a little bit different. You know, it's your first one. Awesome, you know, great feeling. Then you win the French, different feeling again. And then, you know, it's, every Grand Slam is different and, and uh, never will forget those, those feelings. And I'm, you know, it's like, you work so hard and then you hold the cup for two minutes and then you give it back, but the feeling stays, you know. When we were going, preparing for the finals for 1985, US, when, I, when I was playing the finals of US Open 85, you know, I remember being, um, you know, everybody in the locker room and Martina is preparing in her corner and preparing on, in my corner, you know, like for the final. And they call us, call us to go on the court. And, uh, you know, in the old, uh, the locker rooms in the old time, 85, there was a, this, there was this, uh, uh, you know, like they have these helpers, in, you know, who brings the towels over. And this lady had the radio on in the corner there. When, I, when you're walking to the, to the court, like, you know, in, in a low, not so high. And the Tina Turner uh, song, I Don't Want Another Hero was playing. I will never forget that. You know, and I'm walking to the, through, the, through the tunnel to go on the center court and I'm singing in myself. We don't need another hero in my mind, you know, calling, <laughs> singing it. So I was really very relaxed, went on and was in like 15 minutes, I was five love up. But then the song got out of my head and suddenly it was uh, five walls. So I don't know what happened. <laughs> 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 you know, so I never forget that. <laughs> That's a great yeah. story. It's, uh, you, I, you know, sometimes you have a song and you can't get it out. Yeah, you know, that's yeah. what it was. So maybe that's why I was so relaxed. And then I realized I'm playing the US Open final, you know. Number two. Hannah, uh, I know Wimbledon was a little elusive. I think, if I'm not mistaken, you were coaching also Novodna when she was there and she had it. Well, what is it with Wimbledon and you? Uh, <laughs> Uh, that's a good question. I don't know. I mean, um, when I met Jana and she asked me to, to train her, you know, she, uh, she was overweight. She didn't really know what, knew what professionalism is. So it was not more, it wasn't like really strokes that I changed. I, I, I just changed her mentality of thinking that, you know, you got to work hard every day. You have to go out and spend the hours on the court. You have to be positive. You have to, you know, be fit physically and mentally. So for me, it was more kind of mental strengths I gave her. Um, I think on grass, you know, she had the biggest opportunity to win many tournaments. As, as you know, she, she was three times in the finals before she finally won it in uh, 1989. So uh, she was a little bit mentally fragile in a way. But people always thought she was fragile. But, you know, after, I don't know if you, I'm sure you remember that year when she had Steffi Graf uh, yes. uh, in the third set, 4-1, 15-40. Oh, no, 40-15. And uh, she missed this. I will never forget that Wally uh, hit Easy it in the fan. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and she lost that match. And, you know, it's funny. Every champion has to have something different, more than ordinary player and in her with her it wasn't really any stroke or a serve it was re the recovery of losing winning matches like the next day 
she immediately recovered said let's go practice i you know she she just basically forgot about everything she it happened yesterday losing from match points and was able to pick herself up and and really really uh work hard again and that that's a skill because i was i tell you i was recovering from that final for a month she forgot about it in two days number three with you with your team you know you have good memories traveling i know for you it was very difficult being from the czech republic and, and sometimes they let you travel sometimes they didn't let you travel so i, I bet every time you travel it was you know easier for you when you was well, first of all, we had no teams, Gabe. <laughs> it was me and my coach. And um, so, yeah, I never had, you know, because of Martina defection, um, when she defected, uh, I don't know what happened, but I think everybody was always, I remember uh, officials coming to me and say, uh, you know, uh, we let you travel, just don't defect. So, I was one time I was very close to defecting uh, when I got some when I got naked search at the Czech airport when I came back and they just searched me uh, like was so humiliating and I said you know I said to my dad I can't take this anymore I you know I, I just I'm a free person and I am living in a cocoon I, I just cannot take this anymore it's 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 just humiliating, and uh, he said, "You know, Hannah, if if you be if you are gonna be able to to be without your family uh, years, then do it and do it for your career. But uh, you know, I'm I leave the decision up to you. You have to you have to make your decision yourself. And I at the end I make the decision that I will not defect because I was too close to my family, and I just knew I would not be able to." Uh, you know, uh, be without my family. So that's why I didn't defect. But, uh, you know, you pay price for everything in life. So it's okay. And most people don't know what athletes went through during that time. Some athletes were able to travel, some athletes were very restricted. So for you to accomplish good, what you accomplish is even, is, is even harder and more admirable. Well, people have no idea, really, because I can tell you another story where, as a communist country, we were not able to travel to a few countries, um, uh, Israel, South Africa, um, and Chile, because of the regime. And there was an exhibition in Chile. I was invited to play the uh, exhibition there in, in Chile, and uh, Pinochet was in, still in power. And so... <laughs> I didn't want to go my, by myself, so I asked my brother if he can come with me, if they let him go out. And he said, but, and he said, yeah, of course I like to go, but we have a problem because they're not going to give me visa to go to Chile. And I don't, we, we cannot have the Czech government know that, you know, he, I'm coming with you. So basically what we, had to, what we had to do is he had to kind of lost his real passport, apply for a new one from the Czech government. So he got a new passport. The other passport, he, the, the one who supposedly lost, he sent it to me and I got visa in that passport. So he traveled on that. But in the meantime, while we were in, in, in Chile, I was playing the tournament. They find out I was in Chile. So then he was afraid to go, to, to go back, but he had to go back because he had a family there, his wife and, two, and a kid. So I was waiting at the, in Zurich at the airport. What, what's going to happen when he comes to the airport in Prague? Uh, if they're gonna, you know, take him or whatever, and everything, they didn't take him, and uh, he called me Hannah. Everything was, was okay. So these kind of things really play a role, role on your nerves, and you know, it wasn't easy. Number four. How did the Grand Slams treat you when you go back to Wimbledon, for example, last year? Um, there you are coaching. Well, it your was it was nice because last year I went with with my daughters um, to Paris. And, you know, as you know, you've been there many, many times yourselves. <clears throat> there is always, sometimes you have, you have to always wait for, for the cars, right? To take you to the hotels, right? And because I wanted, I won the French Open as a past champion, you get your own car, okay? They, it brings you anywhere you like. So it was looking at me like, oh, mom, we have our own car, you know? <laughs> So it was for me, and it also, you know, makes you feel good. And Wimbledon, how did it treat you at Wimbledon? The same? At Wimbledon, let me think. 
Well, I can, you know, as a member of the uh, or in, in Glen Club, even if I didn't, I, you know, you have to have the, you have to be a, a member only if you win or if they vote you. So I it was twice in the finals and I applied. So like five years later, they, that's a funny story too, actually. The five years later, I got the membership. And I just want to tell you, it's really hard to become a member, not winning Wimbledon because there is like, it's a table and uh, 10 members of the England club and they have a red uh, white ball and a black ball in their hands and they put it under the table and to vote who's gonna be a new member of the England club is if everybody puts the white ball on the table so it has to be 10 white uh, balls on the table if there is one black you're not gonna be a member so it's very, very, very strict and difficult. So yeah, I was, uh, you know, I had 10, 10 white ones, so I'm a member. But, uh, <laughs> but you said it took five years? Well, yeah, you apply as, a, as you know, you, you go, okay, there is this, because I felt like I deserve to have a, be a member because I was twice in the finals. You don't get it automatically. You can also say, okay, I was twice in the finals, blah, blah, blah. And, uh, and then they put you kind of in a, in a halt, and then they decide if you become or not. Number five. Hannah, when did you start dreaming? When did you know that uh, you had that dream that you could be one of the best players of all, of all times? When did that dream start? Well, you know, it was basically when I started to really enjoy playing, which was um, probably around 12 years old, 11 years old. I was always very athletic. I did all kind of sport because of my brother. Uh, he hated to take me along with his, with his friends, but he had to. So uh, <laughs> I played soccer, I played ice hockey, I played, you know, hockey with the tennis ball on the, on, on, on the street, I climbed the trees. Um, it was just, I was kind of some kind of like a tomboy and I always knew, uh, you know, that I can be a good, good, uh, sports person uh, I never knew that I could be a good tennis player but you know as soon as I started playing uh, tournaments I really enjoyed the feeling of winning and and competition and uh, you know you always dream um, you know especially when your dad is telling you, you one day you're gonna win Wimbledon and everything what he said to me in 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 life that I'm gonna achieve I basically did besides besides winning Wimbledon and I'm not saying that's my regret. It's just, uh, it's kind of weird because it was always my dream from a small childhood and I, I never achieved that. But you know what? You can't have everything in life. So I'm happy, you know, I have two beautiful kids. Uh, I'm enjoying, enjoying my life. They both play tennis. And uh, so in a way I can stay involved uh, a little bit and hope that one day one of them can achieve something very good. Thank you for watching Tennis On Demand. Please remember to subscribe.